Hello. Oh, you got it? Yeah. Very good. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay, now ready to work. You get everything there for you? Get yeah, that thing uh, up. Okay. Uh, yeah, didn't I sign? Or is that just a little chip mark? Oh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Yeah, it's some chip I signed right there. Yes. There you go, sir. Thank you. you gotcha. Oh, no, this is mine. All right. There you go. Thank you. You bet. Okay, uh, make sure I've got some sound here. Yeah, I'm good to go. And up, oh, see, I'm here and glad to see you, Alfredo. And we will commence now. I think probably a lot of people may have gotten mixed up and thought that today I was just going to do just a uh, just a screencast and post it. We are having class today, so I'm wondering where everyone's at. I may have confused them. I'm going to do a uh, screencast for Thursday when I'm at the conference, today was regular class day, so folks should have been here. Um, why they're not, I don't understand. But uh, we'll maybe have to have a, a little class team meeting here. Appear to be some misunderstandings. I'm not quite sure what the story is. Okay, now, today I've got, just to run through, I've got these assignments, uh, Management Decision Problem 6. But you can load there. You can either work on MDP 6.8 or 6.9 or 6.10. If you choose to work on 6.10, okay, uh, I have a file down here that you'll use with that problem. So that's that bike uh, database. That's for um, that's for MDP. 6-10 if you choose to use to use to uh, choose to do that. Um, you've also got some uh, assignments over chapters 7 and chapter 8 of Loudon and I want to spend some time today talking about over in chapter 8 oh, just my handy dandy annotation and I'll get rid of that. I erase that out. And here we're going to talk about securing information. And the chapters of, and, the, and the, um, the authors have divided this up into the following sections: why these information, why information systems are viable. And you can see this: uh, the business value of security control, the different components uh, of an organization, the most important tools, and then they kind of give you a review and a summary. And I want to say this again. I'm not an information security expert. That's just not my field of expertise. So as you read through this, you'll want to think about the fact that the authors are going to provide you some terms, some concepts, but you're going to need to buy into them uh, and, and to take a look at them. I'm glad to see Alfredo here and Tyler. Good. Okay. 
And um, we've got, we'll take, first of all, we're gonna look at question why these systems are so valuable, okay? And so let me take that back here. Why, why they are vulnerable, um, not valuable, but vulnerable, excuse me. And we'll pop over here to, to 68, and this just so, shows you the, a basic, cons, a basic um, diagram or schematic of how we link a database to the internet, to the web, the World Wide Web. And you'll notice here you've got several entry points. You've got the client with a web browser, okay? You've got the, inter, the, the, web, the client with your web browser, then you've got the web server, okay? And then you come into an application server and then to a database server and then to a database. And one of the reasons these systems are vulnerable is it's easy to see there are several points of entry. Either way, because notice the data are flowing from and to each of these. So for all intents and purposes, one of them is just simply the number of connections that are made. And you can have vulnerabilities at the browser, the web server, the application server, the database server, the database. If you have, and you can have any origin point for those. So the bottom line is, if for all intents and purposes, you've just got too many points of entry. Now, the authors are going to walk you through some of that in, in, in terms of talking about the middleware and where those can, where you can have some problems, some problems there. Okay, and. Again, it's just simply a question. It's things are, when things are interconnected, it's the connection points that become vulnerable, okay? And I'm gonna pop us over here to the business value of security and control, okay? And we'll, we'll go there for just a sec. That's gonna take us over here to page. To, uh, to page. And For all intents and purposes, the, the, uh, the usefulness of these, the business value of security control really comes down to loss prevention in, in terms of, it's, it's like insurance for all intents and purposes. If you insure your, if you, have a, if you have a business and it's insured for a million bucks, then you can withstand a loss of a million. If you have a $10 million loss, but you didn't have enough insurance, you, you eat the loss. It's in, in, in this issue of, of securing information, okay, that's the business value of security control is just simply what does it cost if we have to spend, you know, three weeks getting back up to speed or two days getting back up to speed. The, the intangible cost of this and the one that I think is, is the most important is very simply folks' confidence in you. If you have a data breach, uh, your customers are not gonna have confidence at all in you. If you have, if you have uh, vulnerability issues, you're going to provide, you're going to just simply leave customers quite uneasy. Microsoft Office is probably uh, the one that has, that has to walk the tightest tightrope for a very simple reason. Microsoft Office and Microsoft products tend to be designed to be used by everybody. And because they are, everybody or anybody can find a way to hack into their system. And that's why they're always doing updates which aggravate everybody, especially with Windows operating system. And so you could also say, well, if I lost, if, if I lost the data from all my customers, well, then you're talking about if you were, if you were tracking, let's say you're a bank and you're tracking credit cards, you're going to lose how much they owe you, et cetera. Hopefully you'll have a legacy database somewhere that will save you the, the day. But it, I think the, the biggest is not just, it, it's rare that, that things will get, that, that information systems will suffer a physical problem. What's more, what's more, what's typically lost is just simply loss of confidence in what you in, in your product and your services, and so uh, that, in my mind, is the business value of security and control. And it's also just simply 
being able to operate and maintain operations throughout. Um, the authors also walk us through the uh, components of security and control, okay, and what those are. And we'll look at those for just a second. We have some of these information systems and controls. And here's some of the general controls. And you know, they are what you would think. Software, hardware, computer operations, data security, implementation, and administrative controls. Now the bottom line is the human beings in the equation are the hardest to control. It shouldn't be lost on us that we've had in the past 15 or 20 years, 10, year, 10 or 15 years, some pretty spectacular situations in which somebody just walked out of the building with the data. They just walked out with, with, with a set of data. And those are the ones that just are just hard to fathom or even to understand. Because for all intents and purposes, you should have had some control on what that person had coming out, coming in and out, taking with them, taking out. Many places will, many large corporations will just simply tell you, uh, we have the right to stop you if we want to. And many of them will make you place your things in a locker in a clear bag so folks can come by and see and they let you know, they'll check your locker. So if you've got something in there you, that, that, that maybe you shouldn't have, that will make you think twice. Military installations are even, the security on the military is even more, uh, even more um, ratcheted up, especially after all this business with WikiLeaks and this other individual who leaked all this data about the, the drone bombings and so forth. So, the, the, those are the tools that are there and the authors are gonna walk through and, and give you the specific data on that. Now, the authors also walk you through the issue of risk assessment and how that's, con and how that's conducted and trying to uh, assign risk to one of these components or maybe to all of them and then some, assess some type of monetary cost either in terms of business reputation or business lost or something like that, so that you have basically a table. If you can't, if you want, you can create a table that shows you an expected value if things go south, letting you do that risk assessment. There are companies out there who will come in and who will check your system. They'll try to probe your system. They'll try to hack it. They'll pay you a fee. You pay them a fee uh, to see if they can hack your system. Okay, the, the other issue that's important here that comes into play is, is the issue of security policies. And what statements do you have? Security profiles, okay? Meaning who has access to, to the information. We talked about this some the other day, we talked about information governance. And part of that is the issue of security. Who can see what? Who can access what? Who can print out what? Who can download what? And who can store on their machine what? And then this is big companies, they're concerned about industrial espionage, espionage or concerned about people just hack them. Well, financial institutions are probably the most jittery and probably the ones that are the most concerned because if they have a data breach, that's bad news. We've seen uh, situations where retailers, large scale retailers have had data breaches and it really is an embarrassment, but it's also, uh, for them, it also makes people lose confidence in their ability to, uh, to, to handle transactions. And I was looking at the New York Times yesterday, I saw an article where there was a proposal that we just go back in the, in the election system, we go back to paper and pencil ballots. That'd be the easiest way for us to take care of all of this. Uh, well, that's fine, uh, and it, it, might, it might help us, but boy, it's gonna, it's gonna take us back about 25 or 30 years in terms of getting a count. So there are these trade-offs, which you can see we have the, the, um, the security profiles and what they can see and what they can't see, and then a series of rules. Where most companies are not really 
up to speed, in my opinion, is disaster recovery. If you are a smart company and you do disaster recovery, you're going to you're going to have um, you're going to you're going to have a backup file. You'll have mirror servers. In other words, a second or third place, maybe a second and a third and a fourth place, where you store all of your data. That it's a mirror and it saves all of your data. So if a tornado hits your building, you're good. You're still you can still operate. Um, disaster recovery also means, do we have a plan in place if a vendor who is providing us a service, say an email, just goes out of business? What do we do? Well, you should have a list of people that you would call immediately and say, we need you in here to get set up because we need our e we need email. Or an ISP would be another one of those, okay? Or the planning for what do we do if we have a, a hacker, and that can get extremely elaborate and I'd say this, most companies of any size and that do any volume of business are probably going to have, probably if they're smart, are going to hire a consulting firm that does nothing but security to come in and help them. The firms I think that get themselves in trouble are those that try to do it, uh, tr try to do it themselves and find out it's not as simple as they may want to believe. So, the, uh, the authors walk us through that issue of discovery planning and business continuity. How do we make sure that we maintain and, and we're, we're still working? They talk also about the role of auditing and we, most people are aware certainly of auditing in terms of um, accounting and financial systems. They're not too up on the role of auditing information systems. And that's two pieces, one, how easy is it to penetrate and get into an information system? And number two is a question of what we call information assurance or information, information assurance or information quality. Do the data match? Are they what we expect them to be? Do they line up with what we would typically see out in industry? Do we have missing files? Do we have reports that we run from tables where the tables are about half filled out, all of those kinds of issues. And here's an example the authors provide us, okay, uh, of, of, of an audit. And so, you know, there's, you say, well, this is all just mostly common sense. And, and yes, it is. And I'd say for your experience as you go out there, if you're in a larger company, if you have people internally who have the background, to do the security work for you, fine. If you don't, hire somebody, all right? That's an important piece. This also involves some things like accounting systems where someone may uh, steal money from you. That becomes a criminal issue. You may have somebody who engages in identity theft. That becomes a criminal issue. You may have some situations where you have cyber bullying or cyber stalking going on if you have a large company. Um, many companies tell folks, we're gonna issue you a phone and we're gonna, we're gonna scan your phone ever so often to see what you've got on there. Uh, it's still a question mark if you work at home and you use your own machine or your equipment, who owns that data? And, and does, does your employer have the right to look at it or not? And, the, and there's, there's, there, there continues to be some waffling on the part of the courts in terms of do they really own that? If I work from home on my computer, is it really, is it my company's or is it just kind of, doesn't belong, doesn't belong to me either? Is it just something amorphous? I would say if you work at home, you would be smart to do your work at home on your company machine and computer and if they give you a phone. If they don't, then you'll need to find out your policy about working from home if you, if you need to work at home or answer emails at night or that type of thing because you just never ever know. And I would say this is especially so with younger employees who text and communicate via text and who may, uh, in the course of what one would consider the business, i.e. doing the business of the company, engage in some inappropriate sharing, things of that nature. I, you know, where that will fall for them, I don't know. So the best policy is keep it business 
separate from your personal computer and your and your phone. If your company provide if your company doesn't provide you a phone, then make it clear that you're using your phone. But be very very cautious and make sure that you don't have something on that phone or say on a social media post or anything like that that's going to look uh, bad. And and these are also the kinds of things that that we we have to talk about in terms of dealing with these risks. And then the authors walk us through this issue of auditing information sources and auditing. And the author's gonna walk us through the, the question of, you know, what are the most important tools and technologies for safeguarding the information resources? And they walk you through a, through a set of these. <clears throat> the, first of, the first of which is identity, identity management authentication. Now this flows, this is an issue not only in terms of logging on, but in the workplace, the physical space where people work, this has to be there. This is the only way that you can make sure that you have taken all the precautions you want to avoid some of the tragedies that we see happen. These systems are not difficult to install that require somebody to have a badge that require them to swipe that badge, uh, to have to put in a, a code, which is why as you work with employees and, you go, and you're at work, you never share that type of data. And again, who are you authentic, your, authenticating your, your information is, first of all, is the physical piece of this. One of the reasons that companies have gone a lot of companies have folks use VPNs, virtual private networks, is because it, it, it once it's identified you as, as an, and authenticates you, you're in a, a fully encrypted and protected system. Now, not totally. If somebody, you know, some hacker somewhere in the world decides to penetrate it, they probably can't. <clears throat> but for all intents and purposes, you're pretty well safe. So the information security is not only just it's not just involving the, the, the computers, the software, the service. It also involves, in my mind, the physical workplace itself, um, where you have control of access to the building. And I worked at one place one summer for three works, weeks where you had, to have, you had to have authentication and ID to get into the grounds. You had to have authentication and ID to enter a certain particular part of the building. Uh, you had a space, a parameter where you could walk in the hallways. If you went beyond that, you could get challenged. You had, um, you had to have authentication to get into an office. You had to have an authentication to get into a machine or to use a phone or anything. And you were subject to search. Of course, it was a high, a high, a greatly heightened, but there are, there are companies out there that are so concerned about industrial espionage that they will take things to that length or, or firms that are involved with, uh, that are federal contractors, for example, that do, do weapon systems, they have to impose that kind of security. So identity management and authentication, as you've probably heard me discuss before, we're going to see more and more the use of, by, I think, biological identifiers, facial recognition, uh, putting your thumb on the machine and it recognizes your thumbprint, uh, voice, um, something or some combination of those. I was watching a television show last night, it was a PBS documentary, and it was talking about the surveillance of the, of the Chinese people. And I think I might have mentioned this the other day, but China has 200 million, 200 million security cameras. And they use facial recognition technology to look for people who seem to be discontented. They watch for people who jaywalk. They literally have what they call social demerit points so that if you jaywalk or you're caught or you're speeding uh, or, or, you, or you're engaged in a protest, you, you can have points assigned. And when you hit a certain level of points, the government comes and talks to you. And you can see the, of what's going on in Hong Kong right now. You can see all the people that wear surgical masks, try to hide their voices because they know if they're identified, they're probably going to be targeted by, they will be targeted by the government if they're involved in some of those protests. 
So the first is ID management and, and authentication. The, the authors walk us through that and then they show you some of these things like scanning and biomedical systems. The second, then they talk about firewalls, intrusion detection systems and antivirus software. I'm gonna tell you right now, I'm an expert. I'm an expert in none of these things, okay? I do know you should have them. And I do know if you're gonna have them, you should have the best quality system of all. Everybody should have antivirus software on your machine if you have a personal computer and on your phone. If you don't, it's not the smartest thing you've ever done to not have it. I, I, I don't understand why you would not. Uh, intrusion dissection, detection systems, there are some software platforms that are for the general public that will warn you of an intrusion that, that, that will mimic, um, that will tell you somebody's, someone's, uh, has, uh, someone's trying to, to get into your, into your computer or someone's tracking you or, or, or a website is tracking you. And remember, I took you over to the OBU website and showed you the cookies, that statement about cookies to enhance your experience. So they show you this picture of the firewalls, okay? And these are designed to keep people out of the internet from coming in, as you can see, and to keep people from getting into your database and into your user systems. The database is the key to everything. And you've probably heard me use the term an SQL injection. Basically, when folks hack a system, one of their favorite things to do is to come into a database and write code that creates problems, executable code, like a query or like a macro. If you've taken 1123 with me and you've taken data admin, and that can start to create some problems. So you have policies and rules on those firewalls and, and how they're used. And the, the policies in terms of their, uh, in terms of, of those, app, in terms of keeping folks out that don't belong. And there are some of the, there are some of these approaches here and, and uh, these are used, and as the authors say, they're frequently used in combination to provide firewall protection. Packet filtering, and you could reach each of these stateful inspection, uh, the network address translation, that'll, that will take an IP address. If someone's a hacker, one of the things they'll do is they'll, they'll use a false IP, internet, internet protocol address. And so the, the NAT, the NAT, sniffs that type of stuff out and says, uh-oh, this person has an, has an IP that doesn't match their machine. That's typically an issue. And then uh, proxy filtering, you can take a look at that. It's a little more sophisticated. Remember that the information that's sent through the, e through the internet is sent via packets, okay? So think of it like this, you load a truck full of stuff that's going to 16 different, different destinations. You put everything in a uniform box and you have a whole bunch of different stuff, but you, all the containers are the same size. And then you drop those containers off as you need to. And then you break those containers apart, containers apart and you start to match it and put things together. That is the packet filtering system and that's why we're, the internet can be, is, so, can be, is so fast and can handle such volume is because we split that information apart and then put it all back together. And it's split, it's kind of like um, a hub and spokes system in, in the airlines. Uh, intrusion detection system, we talk about antivirus software, unified threat systems. All I'm gonna say is this, is hire somebody if you if, if you're running if you if you end up wind up owning your own company and you have any sizable amount of, of employees hire an IT consulting firm to come in and provide you security. Don't trust that you're going to be able to do it yourself. Okay. Now right here in figure 
8 is what they call the public key trans public key encryption this is a model or t form of you've heard of this thing called blockchain technology and blockchain technology i send i, I make a deposit at an online bank okay and that deposit information has it's encrypted with a public key and then that's scrambled and then the re recipient has a private key which will unscramble the public key so the intermediary becomes the encryption the scrambled the scrambled message that's basically how blockchain works and, and you're going to hear about it and depending on how the reg regulatory environment uh, interacts with these firms that want to do Bitcoin and use cyber currencies, et cetera, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that all unfolds. Digital certificates, the same story there. There are just a whole host of these tools that can be used to verify who is who uh, and, and to make sure that you don't have people in the system who don't belong there. Um, the, the rest of the chapter, you know, goes into the issues of, of computing at the cloud and mobile digital platforms. And I, frankly, you know, you can read this stuff yourself as, we, you know, as you talk about ensuring information quality. Now I'm going to take some time here because uh, I think we've we've kind of gone through this, but we'll take about talk uh, just a few minutes about the role of our auditing. We talked about that a little bit. But I want to go back into the course. I want to say this first of all. I don't. I think I've got more than five people enrolled in this course. So where the other people are at, I don't know. They should be here. We have class today. I'm hoping people didn't get mixed up and think I'd be just doing a screencast and today and Thursday. That's not the case. We're having class today. Now, one of the reasons and one of the ways that I've been allowed to, to offer this in this format is that I've had the trust of the administration that people will come here physically on Tuesdays for class and then they're free on Thursdays to be here physically or not to be here. That's their choice. So when I'm looking at, I've got, I don't know, 15, how many of us are in this class? And I've only got five of us. I'm going really to wanting to find out where the rest of everyone else is. And if it comes down to a point where I have to start going, if, if, let me put it like this. You're all folks taking a 3000 level course. So you should be sophomores, juniors, or above. And if I've got to resort to taking attendance via login, which I can do, I'll do it. Okay. And so it's, it's, it's imperative for us to have class and to be here and to talk through some of these issues and talk through some of what the textbook presents us. That's why I try to, to amplify some on what the authors have given us and to let you own the case studies uh, and to let you do the uh, read and learn from those um, so that you get the maximum benefit and let me add in what I can add in. Again, this is a conceptual course Okay, so there's not a lot of um, data analysis or anything of that sort. So it's a, it, it's, it's a little bit like the usual course you take where you, you, know, you learn some concepts, you, you have some exams, you write some papers or do some case studies. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a little disappointed that I don't have more people here. And this is not a trend that can, can, can continue. So I'm, I'm going to have to see uh, how things shake themselves out next week in terms of, of, of what it looks like and what we can do. Now, let me say this. I've used this format if I need to, like today with a conference, pardon me, with Wednesday when I've got to be at a conference, which is to, uh, Thursday, to do, uh, tell you I'm going to do a pre-recorded screencast. I'm doing that for one reason. Number one, I don't want you to miss class. So I'm not gonna call off class or have someone come in and give you an exam while I'm gone. I'm gonna provide that information there and we'll talk about, and, and I'm gonna cover the class and have it there for you. 
rather than just have you all sit in a room and take an exam uh, and have it proctored while I'm gone. I don't, I don't like that. I don't believe in it. And I don't believe you paid for that. I think what you've paid for is for me to be here to lecture, to try to provide some additional insights on the, on the, uh, insights on the, on the material. So the number of folks we have here today is, is not good. This is the lowest it's been, and we're going to have to fix that. Um, now, one of my hesitancies in making case study discussion a centerpiece of these courses is, is that often it's folks can get embarrassed or often folks come ill prepared. And I don't want to put anybody on the spot. If I'm going to do case study discussions, I'm going to do them and we're going to do them right. So rather than walk you through that kind of, of, uh, of experience, I prefer to let you do the case study, get something out of it, get some insights from it, and go on from there and try to take some of the high points of this as, and, and give you some information. So, um, I'll post the, I'll post a, um, I'll be posting a, a pre-recorded screencast Thursday, which is class, and I'll be checking to see who, who, who logs in and who doesn't. If I'm going to have to do that, I'll do it. Uh, that's really all there is to it. And if I don't have someone who says, well, I had to be at this event or whatever, that becomes a different issue, okay? This is a course that, as I've said before, is a tough course because it's very conceptual, but it's one in which you can, Get some insights if you're willing to try to spend some time to dig through them and look for them. And it's one that can be of some value to you because it gives you an oversight of the entire administration of, of, and, and management of information systems. We could spend one entire semester on nothing but information security. In fact, there are degree programs out there about that. So I admit this is a vocabulary course and I admit um, it's, covers a lot of big concepts. So there's not a lot of, you know, you know, manipulating data and that type of thing. That's a more active learning mode, but it is active learning mode. When I ask you to do a case, I give you a format and, I, and I'm going to say this so far, everybody has looked pretty good in what they've turned in. So if I was unhappy, I would be giving people a lot of comments, and a lot of coaching on this isn't good. This isn't right, et cetera. But as, as I can tell, uh, so far things look pretty good. Now, I also want to mention some of these issues over here. Um, in terms of uh, some of these resources here, in terms of um, the extra resources here in the course. And here are two of them for this week. Okay. One of them is a web safari. So what's that? I have a page there with links to supplemental materials. Now I don't give you a test over that. I don't give you extra points if you go over and take a look at that. I do know this, there is material over there that will add to what we learn in the course, usually practical examples that are quite helpful. And so that enriches your experience or it should. Then when I have like these TED guest lectures, these are things from over at the TED, TED website where it's really worth it, which germane to the, to the chapters we've covered and it's worth your time to go over and hear them. It's a way for me to bring guests, the, the best guest speakers I could possibly get in the entire world. So when I tell you these are required, I mean it. I want you to go over and see those and I'm trusting that you have an internal apparatus inside you that says, I want to learn as much as I can. I want to expand my learning as much as I can, and I want to own my learning. And that's being here for class as much as it is turning in case assignments and doing the exams. It's also a question in a matter of utilizing these additional resources like the web safari, and or these guest lectures. Now, I'm gonna erase this stuff here and then we'll go take a look at what I've got here for you. And I'm gonna start with the web safari. Okay, this is, and you're gonna see some things I've used that I think has some value 
uh, this is two years old. I make no apologies about that because this has got, this, this will really help you understand what folks mean when they use this term unstructured data and why it's so important to companies and why it's gonna become so much more important. And then here's another that covers structured versus unstructured data. And then the big data problem, which is primarily focused around unstructured data, choosing the right database for your data strategy. That's an additional, so I've got some good resources there for you to take a look at and to learn. So when I, you know, when I, when I interact with, with, with folks and they ask me, is there anything additional that I could do? Well, I provide you this kind of thing. I don't give you a quiz over these. I'm putting a lot of faith and trust in you that you know you're spending a lot of money to go to school. And at a certain point, you have to own your own learning. You really have to be the one that owns your learning. I can't walk you through and, hand, and hold you through every single thing. I won't do that. If at this point in time I have to do that, somewhere, somehow, we may not have helped you. We may have failed you. Um, I'm also going to take a look here at the TED lectures. As I mentioned, these are indeed required. Okay. These are some of the best minds in the world. And through TED, for free, we can go out and hear what they have to say. And if you're going to spend the money you spend to go to school, you want to get the best minds available. You want to hear the people who have the most important things to say simply because of the investment you're making in school and the investment you're making in yourself. And there's some great TED Talks that I've got over here. One of these I think that's just absolutely fascinating is how algorithms shape our world. That will be a real eye-opener when you go over and take a look at that from everything, and I think probably the easiest example, credit scores. When I was watching the documentary last night, PBS, about the surveillance system in, in China, 200 million cameras. They're, they use facial recognition to look at patterns of what they think are attitudes, and literally, if you do things like jaywalk, if you speed, and you're detected, they, they lower your credit rating. That's living in that type of system, okay? Well, there's stuff out there in terms of your, and I've talked about this before, having worked with credit reporting, with, with a credit reporting tool, algorithms shape things. And so you'll want to take a look at that and see what, what do they really mean by this? And, What's, how does this, how does this impact my life? And, and then what are the business applications that are here? Here's a nice, wonderful, uh, wonderful lecture on data visualization. How do we take huge sets of data and turn them into a, a, a beautiful, rich, and easily understood visualization? How do we, uh, and, and, why is that so important for us as business people, okay? And I think you'll find that as, as, a, as, as, as a very, very useful, um, very useful uh, lecture to take a look at. And then big data is better data. I've talked about that before in terms of leveraging the law of, of uh, large numbers. And again, these are required. I want you to go see these because they're worth your time and energy. This is just not stuff I threw in here as filler. This is stuff I went in and I spent a considerable amount of time saying, okay, what are, are there some lectures out here that are worth keeping two years, three years, four years, five years that have such fundamental importance and tell us so much about what's ahead or coming or explain things in such a way that it's worth keeping. And you could, if, you're, if you wish, I would encourage you, once you're out there, some of these topics like algorithms, go out on TED and, and take a look and see what's the newest stuff. What are people saying out there now? This is a way, again, for you to own your learning. And if you're a serious, if you're serious about a career in business, 
if this is just not getting a, a piece of paper or, or passing a course, if you seriously say, I want to be the top in my field, I want to be a very effective data business, a, a very effective business leader, the first thing you understand and learn is that you have to have an insatiable curiosity about what's out there in the world and how people get things done. If, it, if you say, I want to be an entrepreneur, and you walk into a business, and the first thing that pops in your mind is anything but, how do they do this? What's their business proposition? You see, we've given you the training to go out and recognize that stuff. It's up to you to use that training, and that's where you can get the most value out of your education. We give you the basic tools. It's up to you to figure out when I use a hammer, when I use a saw, okay, uh, when I use a screwdriver, uh, etc. That's that's going to be. We can give you some help and some insights, but in the end, that has to be driven by you. And in this course, because it doesn't have a lot of you know, data analysis work, we have these files and get this answer, etc. It can be a little misleading. And especially if you're doing the case studies, I'm not going to go through every case study and find every misspelled word. If you don't check that yourself, then you may want to say, oh, maybe I'm not using spell check like I should. If you don't say, okay, am I conforming to what I've been asked to produce? Well, if you don't, that may mean you won't do it when you're out at work and you're asked to do that. You own this course. And it amazes me that, that like, for example, with, some, with, with these topics, we don't have more people in here. I'll bet you there are some of us in our course, I'm one of them, who've been impacted by one of these data breaches, who is concerned about is our election fair and square or is, uh, are things getting embroiled, who, who, who asks the question, why in the world would the President of the United States put on the internet for all to see surveillance pictures Okay, how, how is it that, that, that people get in and, and, and corrupt these data systems? Why, won't, why are people so casual about passwords and, and access to their machines? Companies, why aren't they doing more? And then they promise of things like big data and unstructured data and data visualization. What can they tell us and, what, and how can they help us build more sustainable corporations, okay? So I'm, a lot of my remarks today are couched with this fact I'm looking at five of us, and we got more, more than five of us here. The five of you are here, thank you so much. I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate that you're here. I hope maybe there's two or three people with you watching, I hope. And my job, and a course like this is to try to maybe, and where I can, amplify the main points, but it's also to point you in the direction of things like this. Data visualization, algorithms, big data, using those tools. Because I can guarantee you that your, comp your, compatriot, your, your, your competitors out there are going to be using these tools and understanding them you are going out into the most unique job market in the history of the world and the most competitive. And it's not driven by who you know. You may get some messages from us here in the College of Business that it's who you know that really matters. I'm gonna tell you, that will take you into the door. What will keep you in that place is, do you know what to do? Are you competent? Are you comfortable working in a world where so much is driven by data? I didn't make up these rules, okay? I didn't invent these courses just because I enjoy teaching this stuff. I work with these courses and teach these courses because I know out there in the real world, that's what's driving things. And if you go out there and prepared for it, you, you, you'll get, you won't be, you just won't be promotable and you won't be able to think like enterprises think today. So don't fool yourself into believing it's just because I, I know somebody, they'll, I'll get hired. You might, 
but at a certain point, that won't, that won't cut it. So it's gonna be an issue of your competency. And I guess this course, and I have criticized it, and for that I'm guilty, sometimes has too many big ideas about information systems and management to absorb, and I understand that. And so what you probably will do as you, as you go through the course would be wise to say, okay, what's one of these things that I really, really, really wanna learn a whole lot about? And you have that opportunity to do that if you care to do it. I just simply organize the information for you. Well, I'm gonna stop here for a minute. Um, I feel like I've been preaching, so maybe I should take up an offering. I'm gonna see, does anybody have a question or a comment or something you could add? Or would like to add? Anybody? I see a six participant. Okay. Alfredo, Blake. Manny, Patty, Tyler, I'm glad that you're here. Thank you. Appreciate that you're here and you're smart to be here. Anybody have a question or something I can help you with? One of the management decision problems or one of those, one of those assignments. Well, okay, I'm gonna take us back over to the module as a whole and take a look at, for, look at it for just a moment. And these different management decision problems. And I'm gonna go over here to uh, page 242. I'll see if it's gonna let me search through here. And let's see, I'm gonna look at MDP six, okay. So I'm gonna bet you it's over here in chapter six. I'll go back over here to the contents. And it deals with the issues of business intelligence. So we've got the MDP. I, I tell you, you can use MDP six for number six. You can you could use six eight, six nine, or six ten. If you choose six ten, there's a database for that. Okay. Here's some of the discussion questions. Now those stuff from the, from like the MIS lab, if I assign you something like this, don't worry about the MIS lab. Go ahead and take the question and run with it. By not using the MIS lab, I, lab, I saved you probably, I think it's between 150, uh, maybe $175 or more. So I'm interested in you working through those and and here are the decision problems. Here's six eight, okay. And their supplier of measurement, analytical monitoring instruments, and they've got a data warehouse that they utilize, and. they're having some quality problems. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is to assess the business impact of those data of those data quality problems. Now, you say, okay, what paradigm or idea have we looked at or discussed looking at those? And one thing might be risk assessment and looking at, and we're not given details here, but certainly there's enough in the chapter there dealing with risk in the text, dealing with risk assessment. And there's enough out there in the, in the business 
in the Business Online Periodicals database to build a good response for that. Six nine. Creating a single format, uniformity. And then there's 610. And 610, I did provide you with the data from that bike problem. So there's direct connections. And as I said before, I'm very happy in terms of what I see and how you're connecting these, your, your cases, your, your management decision problems to concepts in the text. So for that, I'm very happy. Uh, that's good stuff. Well, if nobody has a question that you really want to ask or I could try to answer for you, I'm going to shut it down for today. We did start a little bit early, so we're in good shape. And what I will do now on Thursday is I will post a, uh, a, a pre-recorded, for Thursday I'll, re, I'll give you a pre-recorded screencast in lieu of what we would do for a class session. That's because I'm going to be at that conference and I don't want to just leave you to take a test or something. To me, if I'm out of town and I can't do something like that prior to so that you still get your money's worth, I'm not to make you spend your class time taking a test, this is my own opinion, is a waste of your time and money. So that's why I set up the test so you can take them at any time. Not because I'm an easy grader, I wanna give everybody an A, I do it because I value your class time. And I want that time for you to be able to use it as wisely and, and, and as possible. So that you can maximize, you can get the optimal leverage out of your class time. Okay, that'll pretty much do it then. Um, again, I want you to see those TED guest lectures. So you take some time. As I said, they're required viewing because they've got some really, really fantastic insights for you to see. These are some of the finest minds in the business world, and I want you to do that. I've got a question here. I see, let me pop that open here. Yes, uh, I've got a question here, and here's the question, everybody. I'll let you hear it. So if we do 610, we just answer the questions using the database you provided, or you still need to follow the format you have on the MB, ND, NDP assignment. Um, I'm gonna go either way with that one. If you can, if you can kind of give me a hybrid of that, fine. Otherwise, just answer the questions using the database. I understand about that. Is that fair enough? Yes? Does that answer your question? I'm waiting for a confirmation. Um, if you, if you can put the reports into one document, fine. I'd like you to do that. If you upload the database with some, and you've run some queries or work through a da the database, I'm fine with that either way. It may be easier for you to do the reports and then just bury them in, in your document, uh, like a screencast and then upload them. I'm okay with that. Anybody else? Okay, folks, well, thank you so much. And I'll do a screencast for you on, on uh, for, for Thursday. And then I will see you in class next week. I would like everybody here physically next Tuesday. Um, I have to make sure that we're still on this, we're all on the same page as far as this class format, okay? Thank you much.